Dalk technique was described in 2002 by Anward and Teichmann. At the time that it was described, the Duos layer was not yet discovered, so what they thought was the decimates was actually the Duos layer. Most of the times the bubble is formed correctly with few air injections and it's evident. There are five signs to corroborate the correct formation. White halo, wave, protrusion, silver reflex and hypertension of the apex. But there are some cases where the bubble formation is not that evident. There are a few ways described to help us corroborate the formation of the bubble. In this case, we can see the surgeon injecting air, but we can't really be sure that the bubble is formed. The most popular is the small bubble technique described by Partha Sarathi and Tan in 2007. The problem with this technique is that you can't see the small bubble through the total corneal emphysema created by the air injection. There are many cases where the surgeon is not sure if the bubble is formed, its size or its location. The only thing visible is a white cornea. To solve this problem, we will describe a technique we have been using since 2010 that we named corneal transillumination. The basic principle is the light reflection over the internal borders of the air bubble. After injecting the air, like we see in this animation, the probe rests over the cornea reflecting the light on the internal borders of the air bubble walls. This simple experiment performed with a balloon and a flashlight shows how the light is reflected over the interior wall of the balloon, creating a spot on the opposite side of the light source. Here we show some examples of type 1 bubble discovered with this technique. We also show an internal view in a research cornea. The air is injected as usual. Once the cornea is wide and turning off the microscope and the ambient lights, we proceed with the transillumination technique. The probe is in direct contact with the cornea. We corroborate the existence of the big bubble type 1, where we can see the full border of the bubble in 360 degrees. We call this sign full moon. This image is created because of the phenomenon called total reflection of the light over the bubble walls. It also helps to move the light probe around to check the integrity of the bubble, as we can see. It looks like the light bounces around, again because of the total reflection of the light. The red arrow shows the reflection over the interior wall of the bubble as described by Francis Price as a reverse movement of the inner reflection. Dr. Price's description was made using a handheld slit lamp at the OR. Here the forceps shows the same effect. Now, when the big bubble doesn't form, as in this case, neither the borders nor the bouncing can be seen. Here we can see a comparison of a type 1 bubble on the left and only emphysema without bubble on the right. This other postcorneal infection case starts with a complication. The air breaks into the anterior chamber. So what to do next? Continue with DALK or convert to PK? To make this decision, we decided to assess the bubble. In our first try, we can see the bubble, but we're not sure of its size, location or type. The next step is to proceed with another delamination. Now it is more clear the presence of the bubble. To be sure, we proceed with still another keratectomy. Now it is clear that we are in the presence of a type 2 big bubble that are characterized of being decenter and having slimmer border than the type 1. We continue transilluminating to confirm that the image belongs to the bubble and not to the air in the anterior chamber. Here's a comparison of type 1 and type 2 bubbles. This other case shows how a type 2 bubble looks like under corneal transillumination. We call this sign waning moon. In some rare cases the air goes over and under the duos layer 
what is defined as a type 3 big bubble. An image taken on a research cornea shows the mechanism of this type of bubble. When we check with the transillumination technique, we can see two bubbles. This is a very useful and cost-effective technique. It really helps you identify the big bubble to avoid excessive injections and it really facilitates the surgery flow. It is also important and useful to transilluminate regularly during the surgery to assure the presence of the bubble, its size and its location. This case shows that after the air injection the bubble is not visible. After the delamination and transilluminating the cornea, we can corroborate the presence of a medium bubble. But after a nucleotectomy and without transilluminating, to make sure the bubble is still there, we cut into the anterior chamber. This could have been prevented with a simple check with the light probe. This technique is also fundamental to identify the exact location of small bubbles to help expand them to a correct size because without identifying them, you would have to continue with a manual delamination. Here we can see a small decenter bubble. We proceed to apply more air to expand it. We recommend to use this technique on every single dalk. In type 2 bubbles, it helps us to decide whether to delaminate or not. In summary, this is a simple technique that can be performed with any kind of light probe available at the OR. It is extremely useful to avoid complications. We use this technique to know the type, location and size of the bubbles. This last case involves an 8-year-old patient with a fibrotic post-abscess cornea. After injecting the air, it's hard to tell if the bubble is in place. The transillumination clearly shows us a type 2 bubble. Even though the bubble is of medium size, we didn't inject more air because of the risk of rupture. Instead, we decided to clearly mark the borders and center of the bubble. The case is finished successfully thanks to this simple maneuver.